Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's with great sadness that I share with you the passing of our dear friend and founder, Jeanette Sawyer. As no doubt everybody knows, she was an incredibly hardworking, determined citizen who single-handedly spearheaded a group to create a historical society for Bridgewater. She created many albums of photos with information on topics such as gold mining, the Civil War, schools, farms, the woolen mill, and small town life. Jeanette was prescient enough to realize that time was short when it came to encouraging her friends and neighbors to look in their attics and family albums for stories, photos, and artifacts of Vermont. And look, they did. As a result, we have a wonderful collection of items and photos that are now safely stored as records of a vanished life. Although we are saddened by her loss, we're all better off knowing that Bridgewater's history is there for generations to follow. Our speaker today is John Atwood, as you all know. He grew up here, moved to Florida, and had a career as director of the Orchid Identification Center, which houses 25,000 files on orchid species. The center was part of the Marie Selby Botanical Gardens in Sarasota. If you'd like to know anything about orchids, he's your man. Since then, he worked with the CB Fisk Organ Company and David Moore of Pomfret, repairing and restoring many orchids throughout New England. Thank everybody who, for coming to this presentation on uh, early 19th century Vermont organs. It's really a sampling of what I know about uh, the early organs of Vermont. And I'm going to give you a slide presentation of organs as they come into Vermont, whether they're built here or whether they're from someplace else. So later in the 19th century, you'll see some very early organs, but they're from somewhere, they're from some other place. Uh, but the first thing we've got to settle is what a, what a, a pipe organ is. And this is, this little reed organ, which is wonderful, is not uh, a pipe organ. It has the sound device or a series of, of reeds, such as like this, one for every note. <laughs> I'm sucking in, I could get it to activate. It's, a reed organ is basically a floor model harmonica. And they, they sound pretty, pretty uh, you understand. That's enough of that. <laughs> and, uh, but that's what a reed organ is. A pipe organ uh, is much more complex. Here's just one note of one stop. It's an, op uh, it's an open diapason, they sound like this. It happens to be a harmonic flute, has a little hole approximately in the middle, so it sounds the octave. <clears throat> Another kind of pipe, is the stopped pipe, that being an open pipe. Now for an open pipe to sound that same pitch, it'd have to be twice as long as this. The other major group of pipes are reed pipes. They're little things like this, there's quite a bit to them. And they have a little beating reed, and they, well, out of context, they squawk. And I thought that I'd also show you uh, something similar that was familiar to Vermont farmers years ago called the dinner horn. And the dinner horn was something that brought the, the men who were uh, sharing responsibilities in, in uh, harvesting corn in the fall. And I can remember when these were used. And the ladies would provide the meals, the, the, the noon meals, and they'd call them in with this. Is that loud enough? Okay, so that's, pipe organs are made 
with these sound devices. Now what I'm talking about is not the electrified types of organs that we so often see. Although many of the mechanical organs, me mechanical pipe organs, they're called tracker organs. Tracker, they're named after little sticks like this. And what they do is they operate kind of like this, but they're not supposed to squeak like this one does. But this, uh, uh, this pulls down, this will put a, pull another tracker up here, and there may be four or five sets of those per manual. <clears throat> and if you've got 56 keys, you've got 56 trackers per group. So although it's a very simple mechanism, if you multiply that out by the numbers of sets of these things, it gets pretty immense. Um, so that's what a tracker is, and that's what I'm talking about today. I'm not talking about Esty. That's beyond me. They produced half a million of these, by the way. And that gentleman on the left, and I'll talk more about him, uh, believed that there were, half, uh, well, we know that they recorded half a million of them produced. That guy think, uh, thought that there were half of them still extant. So if you want to make money on antiques, probably better not start with these. <laughs> um, so we're talking about tracker organs and from the beginning of Vermont. But I have to give you some context. We'll talk about these gentlemen. Um, oh, thank you. Much of my presentation is based on the research of this guy. His name was Ed Bodway. He died eight years ago. But he used to, I worked for David Moore, and he'd come in about every two weeks. What have I found out? So uh, he was an interesting guy. He wrote, along with the guy on the right, this book on the bicentennial, bicentennial of the pipe organ in Vermont, 1814 to 2014. Um, and I think it was this guy, Stephen Pinnell, who uh, actually got him to write, to put everything down in print finally. He had an immense memory. I remember, I can remember, uh, if I can remember, <laughs> uh, moving over 700 cardboard boxes of photocopies and jottings that he had. He moved it from one church to a storage area. And he, I swear, he knew everything that was in those boxes. And there are other stories I could tell about Ed Bodway. But I think my program should be dedicated to him, because without him, I wouldn't be able to give this program. But my program is about Vermont organs from the beginning, pipe organs only, and trackers. Um, and it's, all, it's how they've changed over time through the 19th century, and also how pipe organs get around. When you see a pipe organ, it's not necessarily been there forever. And the other thing is, when you get into pipe organs, you realize history is a, a kaleidoscope of events. It leads to other things. And I'll give some examples of what I'm talking about here. So the other person I want to bring to your attention is this lady. Um, Barbara Owen. Uh, she's 91 years old, going on 92. Uh, brilliant woman. And she wrote a book entitled The Organ in New England. So if you want to know about just about any organ in New England, there's the book for you. I have a couple of photographs out of here of European organs, just to show you the kind of the birthplace of organs. Um, you're welcome to look at those when, when we're done. But uh, 
I worked with her when I worked at the C.B. Fisk Organ Company in, in uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts years ago. And last of all, I want to credit David Moore, who has saved a lot of, of uh, not only Vermont organs, but some Boston, notable Boston organs. And uh, he'll, he, he still continues to, to build. So that's kind of the context of people. Now we go on to the context of the pipe organ. When you look at organs like this, uh, it's wonderful. This, this is an organ by an, an Arp Schnicker. It's out of this book. And uh, who built very fancy cases. Well, Europe, Germany and France in particular, have uh, very fancy ca cases, most of which were built when the, when uh, uh, it, Europe was split up into little kingdoms and there were kings. Kings often donated pipe organs to churches, and I can just imagine that by doing that, they bought the, the loyalty of the congregations as well as the organ builders. <laughs> but this is an example of one. This is built in uh, oh, six, 1673, I think they credited it. It's gone through some changes over time. Uh, all of its uh, front pipes are all new because the Germans melted them, mel melted them down in 1917 for the war effort. But uh, America started out as a colony of England, as you all know, and uh, essentially Boston was a part of England. And so there are cases like this. And David Moore, by the way, built a brand new organ behind this very much restored case, they, which is now their sixth organ behind that case. And it's kind of conjecture what the original stop list was, but they came up with something. And so this organ could, it could be a 1759, uh, 1759 organ. It was built by Thomas John Stun. I misspelled it. It should be Stun. John Stun, and, uh, but the new organ is by David Moore. That was Boston, and there are, there's another case in Boston in King's Chapel, and that one's also an original, uh, uh, an, an original uh, organ case with a new Fisk organ behind it. Uh, and uh, I don't have a picture of it, but there is the crown representing England at the top of that. The, the organ that you just saw is out of Old North Church in Boston. And David saw, noted that there were a couple of pegs in the top of the organ where he thinks the crown went. But that was taken down. Well, Pennsylvania also had nice, fancy organ cases. The uh, the uh, facade of the organ is, uh, was from an old uh, Bachman organ, about 1800. And uh, the rest of this organ has been reproduced. The, they don't know exactly. But the front pipes were sounding, so they build the whole organ around it. And this was, repro this was uh, um, This organ, uh, the, the rest of this organ is by Paul Fritz, the modern organ builder. Okay, that's the context. Vermont did not have, most, mostly did not have fancy organ cases. And wherever my writing is here. <clears throat> the first organ that Ed Bodway uh, noted, the first reference we have is the Norwich Congregational Church, which had acquired an organ in 1814, built by one of the parishioners there. Uh, the first builder was Israel Newton, who arrived in Vermont after the war. Uh, his background was he was a button maker, a physician, and an amateur organ builder. Uh, nothing is known of this Norwich organ. Nothing exists of it but it was replaced shortly after his death in 1856 by an organ uh, by Stevens and Jewett of Cambridge, Massachusetts, 
Now, that, the case of that organ was still extant. I think David acquired it and built a new organ behind it and sent it to Georgia. So um, that case has gotten around. Uh, Newton also built an organ for Claremont, New Hampshire. He built that one in 1796. And Bodeway quotes a critic in the New England Magazine of 1834. There was a very inferior instrument for the Episcopal Church in Claremont, New Hampshire, made by a person of the name of Newton. So it probably was not a great organ, but you know, 1814 is 18 years later. Newton might have learned quite a bit about organ building, for all we know, but we do know that it lasted until 1856. The next builder we'll talk about is Lemuel Hedge of Windsor, Vermont, and it's in St. Paul's Episcopal, and here's the organ that uh, at least the organ case that he built. And let's see, he, he had a broader background. Uh, he was, had been a blacksmith, a bookbinder, a cabinet maker. Look at that cabinet that he built. Uh, a draftsman, he was an inf inventor. He's credited with uh, inventing the bandsaw. Uh, he was also a, a musical instrument maker and a stationer. And supposedly he, there's a bass vial uh, credited to him somewhere in, in, in Windsor, Vermont. This organ was built in, uh, in uh, 1824. Um, it was rebuilt, and then the interior of it uh, was, uh, it was largely kept just for the case, and a Samuel Hamill had restored it. And then uh, recently it's been re-restored <laughs> by um, Stephen Russell of Cambridgeport, Vermont. This organ has become the emblem of the o Organ Historical Society, which was started by the Ed Bodeway we talked about, and, be and also Barbara Owen, and half a dozen others back in the late 50s. And it's become a very important organization for uh, organs. Now back on to Samuel Hamill, Woodstock acquired two pipe organs, one for the Episcopal Church and one for the Congregational Church, 1827. And I, when I look through this, the, uh, the uh, gazetteer I just showed you a few minutes ago, I noted that um, uh, Bodeway had failed to make a connection between two organs that were advertised in the Vermont Republican and American Yeoman, uh, volume 19, number 18, uh, in uh, uh, the April 7th issue, in 1827. We've got two organs in Woodstock we don't know anything about. And we've got two organs in Windsor. We don't know where they went. Now, Samuel, Lemuel Hedge didn't build that many organs. And, but the newspaper also indicates the size and the number of stops. Uh, one organ was of nine stops. It was seven feet wide, 14 feet high, and four feet uh, deep. The other was of four stops. Uh, six feet eight inches wide, just a couple inches narrower, 11 feet high, and three feet uh, two inches deep. Um, by 1828, he went out of the organ business. Now, the Congregational Church in, uh, in Windsor seems to think that Lemuel Hedge had something to do with one of their, with their first, first organists there. We know that he built an organ for the Baptist church. Did the Congregational Church t you, uh, receive that organ as a second-hand organ? We don't know anything about it. But there's some question as to whether Lemuel Hedge had anything to do with the South, with the Congregational Church there. Because he moved around quite a bit. He moved from uh, 
From Windsor to Middletown, Connecticut in 1829, back to Brattleboro in 1835, to Hartford, Connecticut in 1839, then on to Brooklyn before 1841, and he died in New Jersey. So it doesn't seem very likely that he would have been building organs after 1828, although um, they, they think he might have built one for the Congregational Church. So this is a Vermont-made organ, actually, 1824. Now we go on to an organ that David restored with um, Andy, I forget his last name, with another guy some years ago. It's this organ that is currently in Sheldon, Vermont, but we have to back up a while. It was built by Henry Urban, 1833, beautiful little case. Um, these older organs had broader keyboards. They didn't stop at low C. They went down to G. Sometimes they didn't have a G sharp, and sometimes they didn't have an uh, A sharp either. But uh, I believe this organ has everything but the G sharp. But notice the top. These finials here. They couldn't fit it in the church, so they had to saw that one off. And the other one, they just left off. And you'll find the tops of those in the pew down to the left. And they've been there since 18, 1869. 1869. And uh, beautiful little organ by Henry Urban. There were two other Henry Urban organs that I'm aware of. One went to uh, uh, an Episcopal church in uh, Rutland. And that one went to some other church, and that's since disappeared. But the other urban organ went to Highgate, Highgate Falls in Vermont. These are little organs. You've got to remember, they didn't have railroads and, uh, to get them around. This organ, no doubt, came by um, barge uh, in Lake... Uh, because uh, there was a there was a canal between the Hudson River and the Lake Champlain, and so that's the way that's the only way they could have gotten this one in. Well, now we go on to another builder by the name of William Nutting, who set up shop. He came from a well-to-do family and uh, was very imaginative, and this is uh, the oldest organ. Uh, built in Vermont that's still extant. And those front pipes are not functional. They're made of wood. Um, if you look at the bottom, the way you pump this organ, you sit at the console and you pump the organ with one leg. It's a little jerky. Uh, maybe you get better with, with practice. The other pedal operates a swell pedal that opens up the the box that the pipes are in, so it becomes louder. And uh, since this is a soft organ anyway, you, you put your foot on that most of the time. And there's the keyboard. Uh, I managed to record it a, a few weeks ago. And uh, the way I was able to get sound out of it, because there's a board here that pinched to get some keys, and you push them down, and they stay stuck. Well, I figured out for the piece I was playing what notes I wasn't using, and I wadded up a piece of paper and stuck it in between the front of the key and this, and I was able to get it to work. Now, there's my history here, and as well as David Moore's. We were asked to reassemble this organ. It originally was in this church in, in Royalton. Then it was acquired by somebody in, in Randolph's, and many years later, they gave it back to Royalton. And it came through Ed Bowdway, who was conscripted into the army. This is, um, I understand the story is. But he didn't totally get all the pipes in the right place. So we were asked to get it playing again. And we did. The year is 1965. 1965 is 59 years ago. This organ was built in 1842. 
and I'll let you do the math, this organ is now 48% older than it was when we got it all together. Now, does this mean that 1842 wasn't so long ago? Or does it say that we have aged a whole lot? I think the latter. <clears throat> and here it is from the side. And I'll see if I can get the sound clip. This is a hymn by Jeremiah Ingalls, who was a Vermont composer who lived in Newbury, Vermont. And there's a Jeremiah Ingalls Society that does some of his uh, hymn tunes. He uh, was excommunicated from that church, so I read on. We'll get it. OK. <laughs> And he moved to, he, uh, there we go. Uh, he uh, went to, we still don't have it. It's okay, playing. here we, I guess I'd better. Yeah, it's playing. It's playing, John. It's, it's playing. playing? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you can hear the pumping mechanism. Added a stop. Notice that I released the swell pedal, so it got softer at the end. So I made full use of the, or, of the resources of that organ, three-stop organ. In 1851, um, the same builder, William Nutting, built this organ for Grace Church and Randolph Center. Uh, William Nutting lived in the house right next door to it, and I believe he donated this organ. Um, I remember back seeing this in, 18, in 1965. And uh, we were led into this, uh, into this church, somebody who unlocked it for us, who was in the 80s or 90s. And he said that kids had destroyed it. Well, how old were those kids when he told us this? Well, they were probably in their 60s or 70s. It doesn't matter. We got into the, this organ. And the console, you've got to be a little person. And the pedal board was recessed into the floor. And uh, if you look down between the pedals, you saw the ground. So it must have had a tremendous rodent problem in this church. Um, another country feature of it was that some of the big wood pipes in the back of the pipe, uh, back of the organ, uh, still had their bark. Uh, so. <laughs> This was a, a rural organ. He got much better after he had moved to Bellis Falls. And he built an organ for uh, uh, Grafton, Vermont. I played that. It's a, uh, well, it's a one manual organ, but enough stops in there. Um, I also played part of a recital on one in Williamstown, Vermont, which is his largest extant organ, I believe. It burned a couple of years ago. The whole church went up in flames. Sorry to hear that. Now I'm going to tell you the story um, of the, really the beginning of my interest in pipe organs, which goes back to 1961. 
And I was interested earlier, but I, but I wasn't allowed to touch pipe organs. Kids just don't do that. Uh, that was the way they looked at things in those days. Um, but I went to visit a cousin in uh, Northfield Falls, Vermont. He had an aunt who was uh, on various boards, and she got us in to see these couple of organs in Northfield, this being one of them. Um, and uh, when we saw it, the front pipes had been made of so much lead that they kind of did this. They didn't work. They obviously couldn't. couldn't. The rest of the organ worked OK. Um, I'll talk about more about this organ later, because David got the uh, contract to, to totally restore it. Now we're back on when uh, organs are, were in Vermont. This one is in the Methodist Church in Northfield. She got us in to see this organ, and that was her church, uh, um, Rosina Hansen's church. Uh, Rosina Hansen was the source of a lot of our his history books in, uh, that, that we keep in the safe. But uh, I saw this thing. I was just so enthralled, uh, a big organ. Um, Ed Bodway says when it was built, it was the largest organ in the state of Vermont. But this was when railroads had come into play, and they could buy larger organs. It was originally in a brick congregational church in uh, Montpelier um, in 1855. In 1867, it moved to, uh, it was acquired by uh, the Northfield Methodist Church. And I believe the church in Montpelier, the organist was Dudley Buck, who was a very well-known organist at the time. He probably, this is too old-fashioned kind of organ with him. I was so excited over this organ, I went back to Rosina Hansen and told her about my excitement. She never heard anybody who was that excited over it. And... Uh, she said, I heard that organ was passe. What? And um, the uh, other organ I showed you a few minutes ago, the beautiful five-sectional case, uh, I asked uh, my cousin's music teacher what she thought of that. And she had been a, a silent movie. She was play, a, play, a piano player for silent movies. She was a graduate of, of uh, Juilliard, fine musician, but she looked at that organ and she said, that organ only needs one thing. It needs to be thrown out. <laughs> well, this is the way people looked at these organs. They looked at the console. That's as far as they went. And today organists have to be able to play a variety of kinds of consoles, flat pedal boards, curved pedal boards, this way and this way. Um, anyway, that's the way she looked at it. Here's a, this paid off because uh, Rosina Hansen asked me to write a proposal to this church to restore it. They'd gone from, they heard it was passe, to wanting it restored. And so I, res I drew up a, a proposal for the Fisk Organ Company in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Um, Charles Fisk, we got, the, we got it funded, to all $10,000, uh, way under bid for the time. And uh, Charles Fisk uh, subcontracted it to David Moore. And then I moved back to Vermont to uh, help him restore this. I did most of the voicing in this organ, as I remember. And if you look at that pedal board, I built that pedal board, would you believe? I don't think anybody would dare let me build one of those again. This, uh, I was convinced that we were going on to the metric system. And uh, that didn't happen. Anyway, I built that. That is a metric pedal board. It's a beautiful case. 
Now we go on to Woodstock. That was 1855 that came to Vermont. Here's one that came to Vermont in 1881. This is the Universalist Church. Um, some 19th century view of it. The feature is this organ, the organ by Hutchings and uh, Plasted, built in 1875 for the studio of Eugene Thayer, who's a prominent Boston organist. He invited people to come in and practice his organ uh, during the week because he heated the space. Little did he know that he was destroying the organ doing that. You understand that in an organ, pipes sit on something. And they, the, the, they're sitting on uh, what's called a tabletop underneath which are glued uh, spacers, wood spacers that separate the notes of the keyboard. And, but they're at 90 degrees. The grain's at 90 degrees. So when you vary the humidity as much as this is varying between winter and summer, uh, the table board has started coming loose. And what happens then is B starts to be bleeding into C and C into C sharp and whatever. Anyway, Eugene Thayer moved this organ, uh, sold this organ in three years later to a religious society. It was just down the street. Uh, by the way, his, uh, his studio, studio where he first had this set up was in uh, Oddfellows Hall, which is on the corner of Tremont and Berkeley Streets in Boston. And the building was uh, faced with uh, Rockport granite. Uh, if you can uh, imagine what that would have looked like. But um, there was quite a bit written about it. Eugene Thayer had gone to Germany, and the Germans liked his playing so much, he, he did a number of recitals there, and they particularly liked his Bach. And I'd like to hear somebody play Bach the way Eugene Thayer did. I don't think that would be all that appreciated today. <laughs> But it's a, a double, uh, double name stop knobs. Uh, I should have taken another picture closer and without the glare. But um, there, one, one name is German. I don't know what kind of German because it's not the kind of German. I took two years of German, in, but anyway. And, but they're double named. Uh, and it's a bright organ. It, it was more Germanic in its sound. The, uh, well, I don't want to get into the <laughs> details. It came to Woodstock in 1881. Again, we've got railroads. And two members of the church, um, what's his name? Uh, I think it was Albert Gallatin Dewey. Uh, and a, a, a woolen mill owner, another person, sought out Samuel Brenton Whitney. Now, Whitney had grown up in Woodstock. He grew up in the house just north of the History Center in Woodstock. And he became the organist at the Church of the Advent in Boston, which at the time was probably the most prestigious church, mu uh, church musician position in New England. He returned to uh, Woodstock after about 1900. But he was instrumental in getting, the, uh, getting the, uh, that uh, Hutchings placed at organ in, into Woodstock. And here are some railroad shipping marks. Albert Gallatin Dewey and Company, Woodstock, Vermont, uh, via the B and L and N Railroad. I don't know what that, Boston and something. And uh, probably shipping line number 14, I don't know. But there are a number of these shipping marks in the organ. But it was the railroads that allowed these larger organs to come into Vermont. So we had uh, um, uh, uh, nice large organs. Now, organs that were coming into Vermont, this one came in 1882 to Richmond, Vermont. And 
which is a church that I believe closed, and then it came to Royalton, Vermont, in a church just the other side of the street from where that first nutting organ I showed you was, where we had the sound clip. And it was just dumped in the corner. And that church hired us to reassemble the organ and tune it and get it in playing order. And uh, I serviced it just a couple of weeks ago. Again, this happened 59 years ago that we did this work. This is kind of typical of what organs look like in those days. It's basically three sectional cases, big flat in the middle, two smaller flats at the side. And that seemed to be an economic way to produce pipe organs. Nothing like that first uh, German organ that I showed you. Here's the console. I th uh, it only has 17, it was well, a 27 note pedal board, but only 17 of them uh, actually have pipes. And I think the way they played these things is that they've kept one foot on the swell pedal, that makes it loud and soft, and the left foot uh, on the pedal board. Anyway, I've got to try to figure that out because I've got to do a service there in early December. Here's another interesting three-sectional case. This is one by, uh, I don't know how you pronounce, er, is it Ernest or is it Erne or Desmarais in 1892. He was a Canadian uh, and was built for the parish of the Guardian Angels in St. In, uh, St. Albans, Vermont. It's a fantastic uh, uh, organ, especially in the, in, the, in the acoustic environment. You play a chord on it, and it goes on for four or five seconds. It's just an incredible sound. But then it's a Catholic church, and it makes a big difference. Now we're back to Northfield. When this organ came to Northfield in 1892, and nobody knew where it came from, but Ed Bowdway and his friends finally found the connection with Warren, Rhode Island. It was built in 1836 by the E and G G Hook Organ Company. Uh, it's a two-manual pedal organ. It's the oldest two-manual and pedal organ by the E and G G Hook Organ Company. Um, th they made among the very best organs in the 19th century. And this is one of them. It's a very much an English organ. That's great for uh, Eng Eng English uh, organ music. Now we're jumping down to Randolph, Vermont, uh, where it was installed last in um, the uh, Congregational Church in, in Randolph. It originally came to a church that was across the street where there's a music building there now. And this church had another pipe organ, old organ. Now here's a case of musical chairs. That pipe organ, which was here before, it was a steer organ made by steer. It moved to some other church in, in Randolph. This organ Cross the street into this church, and the steer eventually made its way to the Catholic Church in Woodstock, and that's what's there now. So that steer organ's been in three places. Um, this organ is a, is a very fine organ, particularly some of the swell stops. Again, you've got a three-sectional case, and it's kind of humorous. If, if, if uh, they had painted the pipes chrome yellow, it would have been a great advertisement for Eberhard Faber. <laughs> now we come to uh, David Moore and my uh, experience from long ago. This is an organ. We call it the barn organ, which we set up here in 1964. We acquired it the, the, uh, from the Masonic Hall in Woodstock. And it's, a, it's built by George Stevens in 1852. And uh, 
Nobody knew where it originally was from, but it came to Woodstock in, 18, in 1898. And I know the people here. This guy rented David's grandmother's house to the side. He was a baron from Austria. I don't know anything about his history, but I'm sure it's very in interesting. This is David Moore, this is myself. And there we are. Now, what do country boys do if they never uh, learn how to build pipe organs before? Well, the front pipes were full of paint. And we didn't care anything about lead paint. And um, there was a pond beside the barn that we set this up. And we just took all those front pipes and sunk them in the frog pond for five, five or six weeks. Now, it took some scrubbing, but we got all the paint off. And I don't think anybody monitored the lead content, but it's pro probably some of it still there. But there's some... Uh, farm boys have to have... If you're going to be playing with pipe organs, you've got to have some imagination. I have to credit David Moore for this, but how did, sometimes you need to have to vacuum out little holes where the pipes go. So what do you do? Does everybody know what this is? Can anybody guess? Part of a milking machine. Part of a milking machine. So what is this called? It's called a tit cup. It's not a teat cup, it's a tit cup. And what you do, what we did, what David figured out, was to fit it on the end of the nozzle of a hose, and then you can get dirt out of those toe holes with, where the pipes sit. You probably can't buy anything like that for, or, uh, a, uh, for a vacuum cleaner today. Anyway. You have to be imaginative if you, if you grew up on a Vermont farm and you want to restore a pipe organ. But that we did. And here is a photograph of it in Woodstock, kind of a plain building. It was the Christian church then. And the Masons had built two floors right up to it. And uh, we had a time getting it out. When, when you're 16 years old, when you're lifting a pipe chest, chest it's like this, with this deep, and there were three of them in that organ. I'll tell you, you're tired at the end of the day, but anyway. Now, David got a contractor to uh, renovate that organ. He saved the pipe chest, most of the pipes. It went to Iowa City, and they were, very, they were loving that organ up to about four years ago. And I remember David uh, took me out there on a, 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 tune, a trip tuning the organ, and I looked at the roof of this church, which was a, a Lutheran church. The roof was flat. What happens with flat lo roofs in where there's snow? Well. They, they, they tend to leak. Well, that happened. A stream poured into this organ. And I, it's not playable now. I think it's just in storage. Um, hopefully, they will find uh, the means to restore it. They loved it right up until the very last end. And, but where did it originally come from? This goes back to Ed Bodeway and his uh, organ historical friends. It came out of Bangor, Maine, and here's a photograph of it in the church where it was there. And thank God it was moved out of there because a few years later, the whole church burned and part of Bangor burned. So, and that's all gone. I've been to the site where the church was, but um, there it is. It was a beautiful case that the, uh, uh, the carvings on it. It's... Okay, now there's quite a story that goes with this one. This is an organ that we knew about. It was in Wilder, Vermont, in a church that had been a congregational church originally. The church was built by the Wilders, 
uh, who were industrialists, and the village of Wilder is named after them, but um, they also brought with them a pipe organ to Wilder. And this is it. This was behind a wall, and much of the front of the case was damaged and had parts had to be replaced. And David had a worker by the name of Tom Bowen, who was basically an engineer. And uh, he knew about how to wood grain uh, pine panels on an organ case. And if you look at, can anybody tell me what kind of wood that is? Can you guess? It's <laughs> That's all painted on. And it's done by painting a lower uh, uh, a color on the bottom, a kind of a brick red. And then you build up colors, and then you let that brick red solidify and, and dry. And then you add something made of uh, shellac on top of that, and then uh, with a darker color. And you take a comb-like thing and swirl around, and that's how. Uh, that wood grain comes about. And you see this in churches and uh, painted on church, uh, on church pews. So this organ uh, and the church was acquired by a David Clem, who was a developer in the Lebanon area. And his wife is a, an organist from Oberlin, and they wanted this organ restored. So David came up with a number, $65,000, and uh, which wasn't really very much for it. Um, and David, when I started to work on this, he told me he was very concerned about his bottom line. He said, now, don't waste time looking at signatures. Well, wait, wait a minute. That's one of the reasons we, we do these organs. And so I didn't waste his time looking at signatures. I wasted my time. And so uh, I found two notable signatures. One of them got us back to, uh, to somebody who pumped the organ. His signature was back where the organ pumper was. And uh, his name was Andrew Bowles. But a more significant Thing. And, and it was determined he was from Wellesley, Massachusetts. And then I found another signature down behind something that had been added to the organ. And it was, uh, the signature was of uh, uh, Samuel Lee Bates. Ed Bodway would come to David's shop, and I'd shut off to him what I'd found <laughs> about this organ. And he was elated. He said, Samuel Lee Bates was brother to Catherine Lee Bates. Does that ring a bell with, her, with anybody? Catherine Lee Bates uh, wrote um, America the Beautiful. She was going to college, I believe beginning in 1876. This was signed September 1876. Ed Bodway said that Samuel and his brother Arthur were making money to push his sister through Wellesley College. Now, um, Catherine, Arthur, and Samuel, and there was a sister also, they were orphaned early. They somehow stayed in their house, but the, the family was loyal to one another, and they got Catherine Lee Bates through, through Wellesley, and she became a teacher there. I believe she died in 1929. This is uh, Clem's, uh, David Clem's wife, um, Kathy Clem. We had a uh, dedicatory recital on this organ. And of course, she played America the Beautiful. But it, this. Assembling this organ was videographed. And I remember the uh, videographer asked me, do you think we'll ever know where this organ came from? And I said to him, you've got, there are attics somewhere 
where there's a picture of this organ that'll, that'll, that's in that picture. And I said, what you're looking for, because there was pinstriping on the left-hand side of the organ, but not on the right. I'm getting ahead of myself here. There's, this is where the bellows pumper would be. And there's pinstriping on the left. This organ wasn't centralized in the church. It was somewhere on the right. You probably had a three-bay church, one, two, three, and this is on the right. And David Clem's son, Chet, was a computer jock, I'll call him. Um, and he looked into the electronic uh, assets of, uh, of libraries in uh, Wellesley, Massachusetts. And lo and behold, he came up with this picture. Reed Bay Church, organs over on the right, perfect match. There's almost no two organs which are exactly alike. This is a church. The picture started to come together. The Wilder brothers had bought the church, had built the church that this organ was in. 1870, that was 1847. This organ, we knew it was odd in that it had a few zinc pipes in it that the style of the organ went back to 1830, 1820. Well, well, Barbara Owen used to say that George Stevens, who built the organ, wasn't very progressive. So this is an old-fashioned organ, but it had a few zinc pipes in it. Well, she said that zinc pipes were first in uh, organs in 1850. Well, this is close enough to 1850. It probably was in that church in 1877 or, or 1847 or 1848. Um, anyway, that was a wonderful story. And it was wonderful that David Clem's son figured out where this organ came from. Turned out that, uh, I believe in the 1890s, this organ was put in storage the church taken down, and, and the Wilder brothers built a bigger church for them. Then in 1901, they brought this organ to, to Wilder, where we enjoy it now. When you look at those beautiful gold pipes, uh, those are all made of wood, They're what we call dummy pipes. Now, my last example of an uh, organ that's come to Vermont, this is fairly recent. I think thinks about the late uh, 1990s it came to the Round Church of Richmond. It's a two-stop organ. Um, David couldn't get anybody to do a dedicatory recital on it. I hadn't played an organ in 23 years. He asked me to do it, do a, a dedicatory recital on it. To find pieces for a two-stop organ is a challenge. You've got stop one, you've got stop two, you've got stop one and two, and you can play those things an octave high, so you've got basically six sounds. Well, it works for, uh, it works for uh, some pieces, to be sure. Another picture of it straight on. This is a big mystery. Where is it from? Pretty sure that at least parts of it are early 1800s, based on, um, well, the keyboard, for one thing, uh, and some of the wood pipes indicate some age. But some of it looks not terribly professionally done. So it may be that somebody built an organ out of parts. We don't know anything about it. Anyway, it fits around church. And that's great. So organs today mimic some of the old organs of, of in, in uh, some aspects of organs in Europe. This is an A. David Moore organ of uh, uh, the 1980s. And it looks in, in basic shape a lot like, whoops here, a lot like this one. This is an Eutheisen, if I'm pronouncing that right, in the Netherlands. 
But most of the organs today do not have all the uh, carvings around them. So anyway, this is uh, David Moore's, probably one of his greatest organs that he's ever built. And that is my program. Now I just want to play a soundtrack of, of this organ, which is the UU organ in Woodstock. Come on now. Right there? On the arrow? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>